So what are we going to be doing? Well, uh, first, we're going to introduce me because I said I would. So my name's Aaron Jones. Again, uh, I have a master's degree in uh, intelligence analysis with a focus in cybersecurity. In addition to that, I've been teaching here at the Phoenix Linux Users Group as well as at some of the community colleges and other places around uh, town. Uh, in addition to that, I work as a software developer for the Chandler Police Department. I write software, uh, I design products. In addition to that, I teach and train. So I'm AZ Post certified uh, with a focus in uh, digital forensics and evidence gathering. So that's another piece of what I do. Um, in addition to that, I've got some certifications and some different skill sets and things like that. But mostly, I really enjoy teaching. And so that's why we're all here tonight, so that we can talk and learn and, and explore some of these tools. So we're going to identify what Shodan is. We're going to explain how to search with Shodan. We're going to explain how to build an alternative to Shodan. Because Shodan does have some weaknesses, and there are some parts of Shodan that simply are not going to be functional for some of us. So for you to have options, we're going to go ahead and explore, the, explore those options. And then in addition to that, we're going to explain where Shodan is often used in the hacking timeline. Now, while this set of instructions that we have here, these, uh, these uh, course items that we want to go over, these are not the only things that we're going to go over, OK? So this is Shodan. So what is Shodan? Well, it's a search engine. Now, they're self-described as the scariest search engine on the internet, is what they like to call themselves. And we'll go over why. But in general, what we need to understand is that Shodan is a search engine for internet-connected devices. So if something is on the internet, in general, you should be able to find it on Shodan. Now, this is not always the case because of certain things that we're going to go over. There's um, very important things like blacklists, as well as uh, a few other items that may keep your items off of Shodan, which we'll explore here in a minute. But what is the point of Shodan? Why would we need a search engine for internet connected devices? What is this really doing? Well, it allows you to explore the internet. The internet is huge. There's a ton of stuff on the internet. Lots of systems, lots of things that should be on the internet, and a lot of things that should not be on the internet or should not be connected to the internet as they are today. So what can you use this for? Well, you can use it to see a big picture of what kind of devices are located on Shodan. You can use it to have a better idea of who's connecting what to the internet. And then in addition to that, as we get into more of the intelligence analysis side of this, we get into it being able to give you a competitive ad advantage if you own a business. You want to know who's using your competitor's product, what they're using that product for. Uh, if you want to know what kind of other items are being run on the servers where your software is being deployed, you can use this tool for that. In addition to that, we can also use it for penetration testing as well as for searching our own network. So if we want to be able to sit down and we want to look at the products that we have connected to our network or connected to our business, we can use this tool to see what is actually internet facing and what is not. In general, the Shodan search engine is very, very simple to use, but can become very, very complicated later on as you start adding different uh, search parameters to it. It's very similar to Google dorking. Has anybody ever heard that term? few of us in here, fantastic. So if you have not heard the term Google dorking, I will explain that very quickly. Because we're also going to be using uh, some of those tools in conjunction with Shodan. So Google dorking is essentially the act of using Google for the reconnaissance phase of your, uh, whether it be a hack or whether it be a penetration testing or whatever it is that you happen to be doing, you can use Google to look for certain things. An example of that would be to, let's say, uh, go into Google and specifically state, I want WordPress sites that are of a specific version that I know are vulnerable to specific attacks. And then from there, Google will come back and say, okay, these are all WordPress sites that are all of a very specific version. And then from there, if you already have your attack set up and ready, well, then you have your list of targets. Okay? That's how Google uh, you can take this tool that can be used for searching things and for finding stuff and, and generally being a very positive tool, but instead you can sort of pervert it to face it towards your needs in terms of uh, being able to execute an attack or follow that information somewhere else. So Shodan, plain and simple, is a search engine. 
Uh, so we should all be familiar with it. It's a text box. We're going to put text into it. We're going to hit submit. In addition to that, if you know how to use Google, DuckDuckGo, or other search engines, this should not be anything difficult. In addition to that, you don't need fancy equipment to be able to use this. Computer doesn't have to be particularly special. Uh, if you don't have a computer or you're hard up for money, that's okay. You can buy yourself a Raspberry Pi and a few other supporting items, and you can use Shodan. It's just a web page, okay? So how does Shodan itself work? So Shodan is closed source. And we can't sit here and I can't tell you exactly how Shodan works because I haven't seen the code, okay? But we can make some guesses. And we can make some assumptions based off of how Shodan reports things that it finds. So Shodan themselves declared that they use a homegrown distributed port scanner. Anybody know another distributed port scanner? What's that? In map? In mass scan? Did I hear mass scan out there? Fantastic. So there exist approximately 4,294,967,296 IPv4 addresses. Okay? That's the full block. It's a 32-bit pool. And if you were going to scan these addresses, it is known as what is an embarrassingly parallel workload. So you can easily distribute this over any number of systems. Uh, another type of embarrassingly parallel workload would be password cracking. So if you have a whole bunch of systems and you're trying to knock out passwords, you can do that just as you would do with scanning these IP addresses. Or if you're familiar with like 3D video rendering, these are also examples of this type. Uh, for those of us who do Bitcoin, if you have a whole bunch of video cards all linked together, again, very similar thought process there, okay? So, is Shodan illegal? Let's start with that, because that seems to be one of the big things that people push on news articles, is they flout this thing as a very frightening, very scary tool that makes people feel bad, hurts feelings, all kinds of stuff, right? So I'm gonna start off with, I am not a lawyer, and I am definitely not your lawyer, okay? But it's very easy for us to go out, and we can find the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and if you are following along, you can go to that link, and you can click on it, and it will take you to an archive of the 18 U.S. Code 1030, which is the fraud and related activity in connection with computers, okay? So in general, when you're doing stupid stuff with the computer, this is what you're going to end up getting thrown at you, okay? So if you're in this class and you haven't read this, you should probably should. You should probably sit down and actually go and read this entire thing from beginning to end. Can't recommend it enough. But for those of us who are just like, well, I don't have time for that, I'm going to kind of interpret it for you, and we're going to talk about some of the points in here. But again, not your lawyer, not a lawyer, so you need to make sure that you either learn this or you have a lot of money for somebody else, okay? So this is a computer trespass statute that could, could potentially come into play when using Shodan or MassScan. More likely to see this come into play with a tool like MassScan than it is with Shodan. Because Shodan is doing the scanning for you and works as a buffer or go-between between, between you and that data. So on your network, if you were to use MassScan, obviously somebody's going to see you connecting to these systems. It's going to come back to your IP address, and you're going to be the one that gets the phone call. Now, with Shodan in play, Shodan essentially goes out, makes these connections, comes back, aggregates that data, and then makes it available to you in easy to search format. But no matter what you're putting into Shodan, you're not firing off or doing anything on your network that's going to personally send out information to anybody. So they're not gaining any knowledge about what you're doing. Does that make sense? Nobody sees your search from Shodan, whereas people would obviously see your search from MassScan that would be located on your computer. So if anybody remembers when MassScan sort of made it big onto the scene, there was a guy and essentially he had his server set up in his basement, and he was running MassScan, and he was scanning the entire internet, and he was hitting port 22 all over the place, and he was getting letters. The Chinese government sent him a letter that said uh, that they were contacting the FBI because he was, and I quote, hacking all of the things, quote, okay? There was a lot of people who were very upset with what he was doing with MassScan because it was very loud. People could see all of those connections, and he was essentially hitting every single IP address on the list from top to bottom. 
And uh, with the system that he had when MassScan came out, essentially he was able to do this in like a day. And now with certain systems and certain setups, uh, if you're scanning specific ports, you can essentially scan the entire internet in about 10 to 15 minutes with enough computers behind what it is that you're doing, okay? So, what can somebody claim when you are doing widespread scanning? How could that behavior or that decision that you make fall into the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act? Well, number one is the idea that you are intentionally accessing a computer without authorization or exceeding authorized access and thereby obtaining information from any protected computer. So, if I stand up and I say, this computer right here is protected, don't touch it, and then you contact it and you pull a banner from it, so let's say you connect to Telnet real quick and you receive a banner that comes back and says, this computer is protected with a default username and password of root root, please change this. Well, now you know how to access the, this computer correctly, so does that fall in or does it not? Uh, knowingly causing the transmission of a program, information, code, or command, and as a result of such conduct, conduct intentionally cause damage without authorization to a protected computer. Now, generally, this is what they're going to try to claim because they need to claim damages and they need to reach a certain point for those damages for it to become something that they can actually use within court. Because if you go in and you stand in front of a judge and they say, okay, what happened? And you say, well, nothing. And they say, well, what was damaged? And you go, well, nothing. Well, then at that point, the judge is generally not going to be very happy. And we've seen that in previous court cases that you can look up. But if you get up and you walk in there and you say, uh, judge, I want to let you know that this individual over here maliciously and with intent to harm accessed our computer and caused tens of millions of billions of dollars in damages because they pulled our Telnet banner and they received the username and password for our system. And upon doing so, uh, now we have to go in and we have to check every single system. So we have to contact a contractor to come in and do a search and so on and so forth. And then they build a story. And now it's worth something. And now it's a case. Okay? So what if you intentionally access a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct, recklessly cause damage? Now this is generally the one that they're going to call for uh, when you're connecting to things like ICS. Now, for those of us who are military or law enforcement, you hear the term ICS and you immediately think incident command structure, which is like a FEMA thing. Whereas here, what we're talking about is industrial control systems. Industrial control systems being the uh, tools as well as devices that are generally not supposed to be connected to the internet, but usually are, with very, very poor security that are designed for maximum uptime and maximum safety. Now, security and safety are two different things, so let me touch on that real quick before we continue. Having a secure system means, in general, somebody should not be able to contact that system and gain things from it or cause changes to it without authorization. Having a safe system means, if I have a system that's designed to keep a building at a very specific humidity, then that system needs to work all the time, 100%, and not fail. I cannot have that humidity move up. I cannot have that humidity move down. So the system is built to be redundant and to make sure that whatever is going on within that ICS system stays that way. And in general, this is uh, also based on the way that the code is styled. It requires you to test the code in a very specific way. It requires you to develop in a specific way, which means that oftentimes they do not add things like authorization to the code because that's stuff that needs to be searched. That's stuff that needs to be tested. That's stuff that needs to be verified and that costs money. When you're building these tools, they're not leaving the security out because they're being malicious. Oftentimes, they're leaving the security out because the thought process is we will save millions of dollars by not having an authorization system that somebody has to verify, check, and then give a blessing to before we can ever push it out. And then intentionally accessing a protected computer without authorization and as a result of such conduct causes damage and loss. Are we seeing a pattern here? Conduct that causes damage and loss. You need money. There needs to be skin in the game in terms of somebody's wallet for this thing to really come into play. In general, they're not going to go after people. 
that are just looking around, security researchers, stuff like that, they generally don't get popped off this. I'm sitting at Shodan, I type something in, Shodan already has this information, I'm just accessing it to look at it. We can make a very safe assumption that the use of Shodan is fine, okay? Now, when we start getting to mass scan, and we talk about building a Shodan alternative, well now we're making a whole other leap in terms of what we're doing and what's happening whenever we use our tool, and that's going to very quickly change how people feel about what it is that you're doing, okay? So the CFAA functions as both civil as well as criminal statute, and violations can result in criminal prosecution, fines, and prison time. So again, if you read it, it will tell you, you do this, and these are the potential things that can happen to you. Again, very important for you to actually look into this stuff. Now, private parties harmed by violations can sue for injunctive relief. That means that they can force you to do something, okay? So if you receive injunctive relief, that means that you're going in and you're being told you can't scan our network anymore. And if you do so, well, then we can go forward with getting monetary damages. There's a whole bunch of other things that we can ask for. So we have to ask ourselves, is Shodan or MassScan a case of intentionally accessing a protected computer without authorization, and can that cause harm or loss? In general, it's going to depend on if a prosecutor is interested in causing you harm, because laws like the CFAA are in place to allow for enforcement discretion or selective enforcement, depending on how they're treated. Uh, you will oftentimes see this with some companies getting a slap on the wrist for what they were doing or for making mistakes, and then you will see a private person who maybe is a penetration tester who's working out of their home receiving much greater punishments for doing something even less than what maybe a corporation did. Uh, when you start looking at these different lawsuits, oftentimes it comes down to uh, what is it that they want to send as a message? What is a perfect example of that? He was a gentleman who made Reddit. Schwartz. Does that name ring a bell for some of us? Oh, yeah, the young kid, you know, 21 years old. Right? The, yeah, the young kid who was looking at something like 30 to 50 years to life or something like that because he had downloaded some files and he ended up killing himself because they told him that at the end of the day, their goal, their final goal, was to put him in prison. Okay, so he was a celebrity. We kind of all know him. And because of his unlawful access to computers, they told him that they were going to put him in jail for what amounted to a very, very long time. And he felt, uh, as he stated, that he would not be able to survive there, so he ended his own life. Uh, we've watched that video in here. Maybe one day we'll run through that video one more time because it's very interesting to be able to watch it today with some of the stuff that we know now in terms of what was going on at that time that we were not aware of. So your prosecutors are going to hold wide latitude in deciding when, who, how, or even whether they should prosecute for violations of this crime. If they decide that your standing is an affront to someone of note, you will find yourself in court. And Shodan is probably safer than mass scan as you are moving the burden of performing the scanning from your control to someone else, which is very important. If you can keep it off of your system, all the better, right? Now, we will find out why you may need mass scan as opposed to Shodan here shortly, but let's go ahead and continue. So why do we want to use Shodan? What does this actually do for us? What is this tool useful for and how can it help us? Well, let's start off with the fact that not everyone has the knowledge or the resources to use tools like mass scan to replace Shodan. We can't all do that. We don't have the servers. We don't have the ability to write the code. We don't have all of the tools necessary. And Shodan sort of tidies it up and makes it into a really nice package that's very, very simple to use. In addition to that, for those of us who are more code-minded or are more familiar with the command line interface, you can definitely use that because there is a command line interface and API available for you from Shodan now. Uh, I think it costs you about $49.99 and it's a one-time fee, but you then get access to being able to script, which is a very powerful tool. And uh, we'll go over that just a little bit. We'll touch on it some. But what I wanted to do here today was stick really with just using the graphical user interface and what you can access from the web. But the API and the command line interface is extremely powerful. So if you're familiar with those kind of tools, more power to you. Now, in addition to that, if you're looking for a lot of information, that means that we're going to have to have a way of parsing that information. Now, oftentimes, what does that mean? We're going to need a tool like Splunk, maybe Elastistack, 
We're going to need something to be able to funnel our information from MassScan into a method by which we can then search that data and then turn it into something actionable. Okay? Does everybody know what I mean by the term actionable? Some of us? Okay. Not everybody? Okay. So for those of you who don't understand, generally when you gather intelligence, the reason why you're gathering that intelligence is because you want to take action. You're going to do something with it. Now that could be, I'm going to pull a whole bunch of information about a server and then from there I'm going to reach out and I'm going to contact somebody because the person on this server is doing something bad. Uh, they're sending out spam, they're using it for DDoS, they're doing something with it, whatever it is, and then we're going to go inform somebody. But we take an action. It's not just about gathering the data, but it's about turning that data into something that you can use that uh, becomes a tool. Okay. So being able to search through that data can be very difficult if we're looking to gather a whole bunch of it and then needing to put it somewhere. So Shodan will simplify that mess. It does pretty much all the heavy lifting for you. It's very easy to search through and there's a whole bunch of tools that we can use for that. So where do we really want to start? Well, in general, we're going to start with reconnaissance. Okay, That's where Shodan sort of shines in terms of gaining access to a tool where you can then go out and you can look at what's going on in the world and find out what is out there. And then from there, that's when action comes forward. Publicly available information is extremely powerful. I have done classes in here with some of you where I have taught uh, open source intelligence gathering. Uh, I have taught how to go out and actually find data on people, companies, on tools, on a whole bunch of stuff, and then to be able to take that information and pivot from item to item. Um, when I say pivot, what I mean is think of your information and your intelligence like a tree. Okay? Generally, we're going to start at the base of the tree, so we've got a trunk in front of us, and then if you look up, you see branches in all kinds of different directions, right? Sort of the, the thought process here. So we start at the bottom of that tree, and as we move up through the tree, we can follow those branches to different information. And sometimes you reach a dead end, and you have to turn and then move to the next branch so that you can continue your way up to your goal. Okay? That's the easiest way to think about what you're doing. When you start with Shodan, you're starting at a certain point, which means we may not even have an IP address yet. We may not even know what we're looking for yet. Maybe we only have a domain name. Or maybe we don't have a domain name. Maybe we only have an email address. We may be starting at zero, and then from there we need to be able to branch out until we gather all of the data we need to be able to do whatever it is that we're trying to do. So if you're following along and you have not done so, you're going to want to install something called DNS utils. Now, I use Manjaro. So I do sudo pacman switch s and then dns utils. If you're using something like Ubuntu, you can do the same thing with apt-git. Uh, whatever flavor of Linux that you're using, if you're going to be following along, that's the command that you need to run so we can get access to things like whois. All right? Once you have done so, I'm going to zoom in on this real quick, and then I'm going to explain what's going on. Because I want you to see what it is that I'm doing. Can you see that OK? Does that come out fine? OK, good. So it's running through. And we're running essentially two commands with a pipe between them. OK? So the first thing that I'm doing is I'm running host on Dell.com. And that's giving me an IP address. So if I run the command host on Dell.com, that gives me a list of IP addresses that are linked back to Dell.com. And then it also lets me know what their mailing uh, account is, their uh, MX record is. So I know it's MX2 and MX1 at Dell Corporate dot whatever, whatever. Okay? So I have some information now just off of a domain name. And then after I have that domain name, I then run a who is for the first IP address, which is 143.166.147.101. And I pipe to less. Does everybody know what the pipe does? Essentially, what you're doing is you're forwarding information from the who is command into the less command, and then you're allowing that data to just kind of come out for you so that it doesn't just fill up your screen and scroll everything. Now you have a little bit more control over that data. Upon doing that, we get a CIDR, and it's 143.166.0.0 forward slash 16. That's very important. That information right there. That's what's going to go into our search on Shodan. So if you would like to follow along, 
we can go to shodan.io and then up here in the box. Now, if you're new to Shodan and you have never used it before, you have to log in. Uh, I should not have to log in if I come over here. Good. Now, for using some of these commands, we have to have an account, okay? So I'm going to do net and then a full colon. And I want to do 143.166.0.0 forward slash 16. 143.166.0.0 forward slash 16. I'm going to verify that's true. Yes. And then hit search. And now what we have done here is off of that subnet, we have now found all 935 computers that are publicly available from Dell that is assigned to that IP address. Now the reason why we can use that command for net is because Dell is a relatively large company and they were able to purchase their IP address in a block. Okay, So they have a large number of IP addresses that are all assigned to them. And so this functions for this, comp this company. Now this is not necessarily something that we can do for all companies, but for Dell because of their size and because of uh, essentially how their network is designed, we can do this for Dell. So let's go over some of the stuff that we have now been presented. Again, net 143.166.0.0 forward slash 16. We get a total result, and then we find out that all 935 servers are located where? Right. Well, they highlight Alaska. But in general, you're going to find most of the systems are continental US. Uh, but we have 935 systems all located in the United States. Now, what services are we looking at here? These are the things that they're running on these computers. So we have HTTP, right? Most likely port 80. We have HTTPS, most likely port 443, right? Uh, NTP. 38 of those systems are running NTP. And then we have 30 systems that are offering connections through SSH. Okay? So that tells us that if those systems are offering a connection through SSH, there's a very good chance that those systems are trafficked by maybe vendors, maybe people who need access to this network that they can't provide a VPN to. There has to be a reason why they have these systems available for somebody to connect to without some sort of protection between the two. Now, we're not looking yet even to find out, is this only key pair? Uh, does this allow connections through password? Like, what are they actually doing with this thing? We're not there yet. We're just finding out what tools are available. And then they have DNS servers as well. They're running their own DNS servers, 16 of them. And of course, the organization itself is Dell. All 935 servers are owned by Dell. And then their operating systems. They have Windows 7 or 8, they have Linux 3 point something kernel, and then they have Linux 2.6 point something kernel. Okay? And then here are some of the products that they're using. We know that they use Apache. We know that they have Microsoft IIS, HTTPD. They have Microsoft HTTP API. They have NTPD, and they have OpenSSA. Okay? That's a lot of information, right? We know a lot about Dell's network already with just a single command. We hit search, we're just looking at their net, and now we have a ton of information about what they're doing and what kind of tools they're using. Now, does this mean that we have a bunch of exploits all lined up for this and, and that's it, show's over? No, it doesn't. There's still other things that you would need to do or to look at or to figure out what's going on, but this is a very easy way of getting a ton of information. Now, in addition to that, some of this information also is of interest because it starts giving us a lot of surrounding intelligence. Now, it says that most of these servers, uh, and when I say most, I apologize, I mean all of these servers are located within the United States. But where? Well, we see Round Rock, Round Rock, Round Rock, and then Manor, Round Rock, Manor, Manor, Round Rock. Starting to think that maybe they have a data center somewhere out in Texas. Right? Let's hit details and find out. So for this very first server, you immediately get a map. And so we can see, in general, the location of where these servers are. So now we know a physical idea 
of where the data center is that is storing Dell's information. And having cheated, because I built this, I can tell you that most of them are located in Texas. Okay? In addition to that, I can tell you that surrounding this are companies like Home Depot, companies like Target, and a few other places that are all running servers in similar data centers or in the similar area. Okay? Uh, in addition, since we hit more information on this server, now we have, of course, IP address. We have the internet service provider, which is Dell. Therefore, also explaining why they have a block of IP addresses that are assigned to them. So we know that Dell is big enough that they've got their own ISP. Essentially, they are their own ISP. So they have a big block of IP addresses, and that's where all their systems are assigned. And then we can start seeing what tools they're using. Again, we're going back to running Microsoft for certain things. Uh, we see port 80 and port 443 open here, which means that for this server, we can connect off just regular HTTP. Or if we want to, we can connect to this server off of HTTPS. And we can make a secure connection to it to a web page. I am going to, real quick, see if this system is designed to allow us to simply dump an IP address in there and connect to their page. So it doesn't look like it is. Fantastic. So you need to know the host name. So Aaron, yes. the changes that they've made with who is and everything, how does that affect your usage of who is to get to this point? Uh, so the only thing I can tell you is, in general, all of the places where I used it, it was effective enough to get me somewhere. So again, whenever you're out there and you're actually doing, a, let's say, a, a mind map, let's say that you're using something like FreeMind or Maltigo or something similar like that in order to, to map out a network, some of those tools will actually come with um, like who is lookup built in directly into the tool so you have a script. So you feed it a bunch of IP addresses off of like a CSV file and then it'll go in and it'll try to find all kinds of information out for you off of stuff that it finds. Uh, if it works for you, great. And if it doesn't, well then you'll have to pivot and you'll have to move to something else. That's the only thing that I can say on that. So this is sort of a recap right here talking about some of the stuff that we saw. So another system that I thought I would look at is Quake servers. Quake's kind of old, right? Let's see how many Quake servers are still out there. So if we go in to Shodan and we do port colon and we're looking for 27960. 27960. And theoretically, off of that port, we would be looking at Quake servers. However, that port's kind of old, right? Quake's a little old. And it looks like some of these other countries have started to use that port for some of their tools. Uh, and when you really look in here, you'll start to see some of the computers that are on here are pretty interesting, like Syrian Computer Society. That's a strange one. They're running a Quake server. I highly doubt that. Possible, right? Yeah, they're running Ubuntu. <laughs> so they got a copy of Ubuntu running in Syria right now. But is it Quake? I don't know. Uh, we also have Thailand in here. China uses it, and that's all part of their Unicom network, which is interesting. That's a telecom. So if we go there, take a look at all those ports that are being run. All right. Obviously, that system's got to be used for something. Now, I'm not going to go clicking through that. And I'm not going to go poking around inside of China's telecom network here in front of everybody. But we can see that they have tons and tons of stuff, including some DNS stuff in here. So I would venture to guess this server right here is probably pretty important for Chinese telecom. Tons of ports open. They're doing some stuff with DNS. Probably useful to them in some way. What are some of the other searches that we can include? Well, we can start with postal code. So you can do postal code and then put in a postal code 
85225. Postal 85225. Oh, did it block me? Close that. So what's that postal code? It says what's that? Says yeah, Chandler. So here's all the systems in Chandler that are currently available through Shodan. We have approximately 13,003 computers, obviously all in the United States, correct? And then we have stuff like 4567, HTTPS, HTTP, SIP, SIP's interesting. And then 2000. And what are some of the organizations that are hooked up to this? How about CenturyLink, GearHost, Cox Communications? CenturyLink and Cox Communications, what does that tell us? ISPs, but that's also probably what? Home, right? So we're looking at stuff that is connected to people's homes right now. So we have a whole bunch of people here within just Chandler itself that have opened up specific ports on their network and have things available to the public for people to find. Okay. Um, I can't talk about that. Okay, moving forward. Uh, there's certain things that you can look for that if you were to find them would probably be indicative of people doing bad things from their home. And then from there, you could move forward, uh, let's say, in terms of taking a look at what they're doing uh, just with publicly available information and then contacting people so that they can go stop that. Okay, there, short. Short answer, people do dumb things from their home and they make it available through Shodan and you can see it. How about some of the operating systems that are available? Linux? Uh-huh. I'm glad you saw, <laughs> glad you already saw that. So we have Linux, three point something, so that's probably a relatively updated copy of Linux, more, more newer, okay? We have Windows 7 or 8, not surprising. That's, we're going to see that all the time, right? Window, uh, Linux 2.6, that's getting a little bit more interesting. Um, probably something maybe legacy or something that maybe a company's running, I would assume. Uh, probably not so much something that somebody's running from their home whenever you're seeing that. And then we have Windows Server. Only 13 of those, though. And then we have some Windows XP systems. Is the Linux 3, is that a kernel? That is. So that is on your, your kernel. No Windows 10. Good. They actually, Windows 10 may come back as either Windows Server or 7 or 8. It's possible uh, just because of the way that Windows essentially does things not great. So some of the products, and then we'll, we're going to go back up here and we're going to go to OS XP actually right here. Let me just put that in there real quick. So some of our products, of course, Microsoft IIS. That's a web server for Microsoft products. Uh, we're looking at M5T SIP stack. That's interesting, 647 systems that people would probably want to take a look at. Uh, some micro tick bandwidth related stuff. I bet that's ISP related, don't you think? Something checking bandwidth and, and looking at some of that stuff, very interesting. And then we have micro HTTPD. Micro HTTPD. Maybe we're looking at some routers, something that needs to be able to run a internet-facing web, uh, web server that needs to be very small, very fast, easily accessible. I have a whole bunch of weird stuff in here, right? Uh, in addition to that, uh, I ran something very similar to this a while back, and I think it's also interesting that I'm not seeing the, the product on here anymore. But uh, I ran one of these searches while I was building this. During that search, I discovered that there was some open ICS stuff, but I tracked it back to a house. So this guy was running a full industrial control system out of his house for keeping things cool with a um, sort of a margin of error down into like the negative 90 something degrees, which was weird to me. So I gathered up all of that information and I took it to somebody and I was like, hey, I don't know if this guy's maybe like running a body chop shop and he's got to keep the bodies extra cold or what's going on, but the guy's got an ICS system 
directly hooked up to his house. So I should probably look at this. And then I passed that off because it was strange. Uh, some of the sensors that he had would be like $5,000 a sensor, but running off of a home network, which was very interesting in a not great neighborhood. How'd you know it was a home and not a, just like a small business? Uh, so whenever I pulled the IP address, it came back to a search century link, which it could be. Oh, maybe he has a small business at home. I'm not sure, but it was directly inside of a neighborhood. So the GPS coordinates took me to a specific house. And then from that specific house, I, I went and I pulled all the information from Google on that house. And we'll talk about this here in a minute, how you pivot from getting information on a server, and then you move to the location on the server and who the ISP is, and then potentially who is renting from that IP, ISP, and then so on and so forth, and you just move. So it was a rental house, from what I could tell. Uh, but with a super kick-ass, very expensive ICS system connected to it. So, I don't know. It could be anything. Aaron, yes. since most of these home systems would be DHCP, how accurate to this moment do we know that that's at that location and that hasn't been served up to, say, another location? Well, you don't, so potentially. But once you have that IP address and you have who issued that IP address, then, of course, if you have the capability to do so, then you can contact those people and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, and this is the reason why I need to know this. Who actually has this IP address, and what is this being used for? Because it's publicly available, and potentially this could be a health risk or a hazard for somebody. So you're taking all of that available information to you, and then you're building it up into a report, and then essentially you pass it off to somebody else, and then they're able to go on and do things further that I wouldn't be able to do. If, so in short, I wouldn't be able to call CenturyLink to do it. I'd have to have someone else who has that authority? Essentially, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, let's talk about the illegal side of this. Let's say that we're bad guys. Okay? And so then I find something interesting, and I want more information about it then what are you going to do? Well, if you, let's say uh, you know somebody who's working there for minimum wage or whatever, and you got a sweet $100 bill in your pocket, and you call that person up that you know who works there, and you tell them, hey, I got 100 bucks for you. Can you pull this information for me? Uh, that happens all the time. Okay, That's not a rare thing. In addition to that, you can go on the dark net, quote unquote. I hate that term. But uh, there are places on the dark net that you can go to buy access to the S7 system. So you would have access to like cellular records for like 60 bucks, okay? Uh, simply because people are already in there and like there's kids, like literally teenagers, 12, 13, 14 years old who are hanging out in the S7 network and in an IRC chat room and you just make friends with them and they give them 60, 70 bucks and you have access with the ability to start pulling stuff from S7, including to the point of where you can reassign people's phone numbers. And that's how they break into or uh, get around when we use our cell phone as a two-factor tool. So text messages. So if you use your cell phone for two-factor, then that S7 network would be the bridge that you would need to be able to get around that two-factor by assigning the cell phone to yourself or to one of your own devices so that that two-factor text comes to you instead of to somebody else. So. Uh, that's the bad guys. And then on the good guy side, you just pick up the phone and you ask because you have authority. From that same mechanism, can you man in the middle of the IP? Uh, potentially, yes. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff that you can do with the S7 network. In one of my talks, I actually have one of the instruction manuals for the S7 network located within it. Uh, I think if you go into my Retro64 site and then go to search and just type in S, like Sierra, and then 7, and hit search, it should come up with the talk. Uh, and then from there, you should be able to find it. So you can get the instruction manual for actually what's going on inside of that section. OK? So doo -doo -doo. no results found. OK. So I went ahead and drilled down a little bit farther into the Windows XP systems, because that was brought up. Somebody noticed the Windows XP systems. So what are we looking at? We got an HTTP server. We got something running on 9002. We have a modem web interface. That's interesting, right? That's probably weird. And then we have an HTTPS server. 
So who owns these? Well, Cox Communications is doing something bad because they're running a Windows XP system facing the with something available to it. We'll get to that in a second. We'll drill down further. Okay, TW Telecom Holdings, they're probably doing something weird. That's another telecom company. So now we're at two telecom companies that are running Windows XP systems that are internet facing with something available to the internet. And then finally we have GearHost. So none of these are being run by civilians in their home. These are being run by companies who probably know better than to be doing what they're doing. But we have drilled down from the global internet to Chandler we have drilled down into Windows XP, and then now we can drill down into Cox Communications. And we see that they have a sonic wall server. And let's see what else they have. Port 7547. Anybody want to look up that port? And let's find out what that is. Anybody got their device? You want to do it? You want to play? Participate or no participate? 7547. So tell me what port 7547, what is the, what generally can we think would be located on that? So a WAN management tool is publicly internet facing on a Windows XP box owned by a telecom system out here. Easy question for everybody. Good idea, bad idea. Good if it's a honeypot. That's what I mean. <laughs> there we go. We'll get into that as well, too, here in a minute. We'll talk about honeypots. So we're at a point where we're like, oh, here's a bad thing that's in our own neighborhood. This is our home, and somebody's doing something probably potentially silly, unless it's a honeypot. Now, we'll get into honeypots, and I'll actually show you where you can get one. You can run your own. I used to run mine. I ran one for about a year. Generally, it's kind of boring. Uh, sometimes somebody smart will jump in there. But if they're smart enough to do something cool on your honeypot, they realize what they're doing very quickly and they bounce out. They don't stick around for very long. So. Pull in a side question. What's the odds of someone like CenturyLink or uh, Cox running a honeypot? You know, I don't work for them, so I don't know. Um, go ahead. I used to. OK, fantastic. So I actually was, uh, this is, Decades ago, but I was the, the basically the help desk manager when Cox first did do that stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was back when they were working with at home. They were definitely doing honeypot type of stuff. Really? I'd imagine they're still doing some of it, um, but the culture changed quite a bit <coughs> after the dot bomb mm -hmm. era. Um, but yes, they were they were doing stuff. And I know of people over at uh, uh, Quest or whatever the heck they are nowadays uh, that do that type of thing. Yeah, so generally. So now that we got to see some of that other stuff, and we, we drilled all the way down into Chandler, let's look at some of the other stuff. How about Apache? So we'll type in Apache. But what if we only want to know for the city of Austin? Austin's a pretty happening place, right? So we type in city, colon, Austin. And we hit search. And our very first hit there is a Chinese company that is running a server out of Austin. Now, of interest is there's also one item in there for Canada, which is a little strange. But some of our services, HTTP, HTTPS, and then HTTP on port 8080. That's probably interesting. That would be another thing to drill down into. HTTPS on 8443. Generally, where do you see people using 8080 or 8443? They're either trying to hide it or potentially they're doing development work. So you're trying to keep it from somebody being able to see it or you're doing develop work and generally you're running like a live version on port 80 and 443 and then you have like your develop version on 8080 and 8443. Now, we're not going to poke into there yet, but just an idea. And then you have 8081, which is interesting as well. Uh, that, again, potentially somebody trying to hide it or doing devel work or something similar. We have tons of uh, organizations here. Uh, NexusNet, LLC, they've got 12,598. How much do you want to bet NexusNet is probably a ISP or potentially some kind of data center, right? 
uh, software works group, probably another data center. Tierpoint, Precipice, and then Incero. Now remember, these business names and the registration for these business names do not necessarily correlate one for one with a business that you know. Okay, so they could be Incero LLC, but in reality, they're you know super honking good uh, datacenter.com, and that's the company that you're doing business with because of their DBA or whatever. So keep that in mind as well. Again, it's pivoting. So you find a data center and you need to know information about that data center. So you're going to move over and you're going to do research on the LLC. Potentially, you're going to go through public records that are available through, like, let's say, the city of Austin. Uh, you're going to be looking for maybe court records. Uh, you're going to be looking for anything in relation to that name until you're able to pin it to a company. And then from there, you've added another branch, right? Now, I'm going to pause here to kind of go over something. So really what we're talking about here is learning to have the most razor focused ADD that you can ever imagine. Like that's what you really need to be able to work with this because what you're doing is is you're finding something of interest, researching it, and then moving on to another item of interest and then doing that over and over and over and then eventually you're going to have to turn around and work your way back down the chain and then take off in another direction. So that's a skill that I can't tell you how to master, but if I can give you one recommendation when you're learning this, is get yourself a notebook and a pen. I'm dead serious. A notebook and a pen is probably one of the most powerful things that you can use while you're doing this. If not, a big, big, big 4K monitor, get yourself a nice big 4K monitor and run a copy of Vim down in the bottom left-hand corner and just start putting information in and mapping it out as you go. Okay, whatever you need to be able to take notes, but you need to be able to take notes as you work through the data. And it's very, very important that you're able to follow that back. So that product right there, Jetty, anybody know what Jetty is? No? So Jetty is essentially, well, it's essentially a web server, but one of the people that loves to use Jetty and that when Jetty pops up is of interest is wind farms. So a lot of our wind farms out here are running on Jetty. So if you see a publicly available Jetty server, potentially that's a wind farm. Now I'm not going to go telnet into it. I can't even do it on this system. We're, we're essentially read only right now. But Jetty is known as the, the, what amounts to the wind server uh, wind farm system. So that potentially is an ICS system right there, and that pops out to me. Now, we also have Apache Tomcat. That's interesting. We have Apache Advanced, so we're looking at some Java stuff potentially going on here, which means that there's a Java applet that's being made available to the internet. That's, again, it's rabbit holes. You're, you're walking into a field, and you see 10,000 rabbit holes in front of you. Uh, well, I'm sorry, 50,932 rabbit holes. And then it's figuring out which one is the one that's going to take you to whatever it is that your goal is. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. We're going to start talking about exploits too, because we just talk about everything in here, remember? So this is just Austin, Apache, Austin, all essentially Apache products, stuff that's going on there, and different companies that are all involved in it. And you can just go through here. And if you look, we can also see different products that are available for them. So what are they running here? Well, we can see that they have PHP available. What's that B? Anybody know what that B is? No? Because I was hoping to know. <laughs> Bootstrap? So they've got Bootstrap that they're running on this server. So very quickly, you're able to figure out what tools are used how they're applying those tools and where they're being used. Let's see these little purple stairs. What's that? Modernizer? I've never heard of that. Probably some kind of PHP uh, uh, development bootstrapper or something very similar. Who knows? Uh, Moo Tools. Google Font API. So 
we have tons and tons of information about what's going on here. And this is a sign-in required up here at the top, just to let you know, hey, if you're coming to this web page or this server, you need to sign in. Because it's trying to give you as much information about the headers as we can get. And we'll see very soon why that's useful. So you can also search by country. I'm not going to do that. I put US up there. As long as you know your country codes, you can very easily figure out by country. Uh, we can go by host name. So if we want to find all the Nginx servers that are owned by Google, then we can do Nginx host name colon Google. And that will come back with every single host name that is hooked up to Google for Nginx. Uh, we can do by nets, obviously. So you can do Cisco and the net IP and then forward slash 24 or whatever. And so if you want to find all the Cisco systems, bless you, you can do that. We can do it by OS. So we have HTTPS, and then we want to find all the systems that are based off of Windows. We can do that. We can do by port. And then we can do by title. And so I went in there, and since I work at the Chandler Police Department, I looked up title Chandler Police Department. And what do you think I found? Let's find out. Title Chandler Police Department. Well, there was. Uh, let me see if it's. Um, Yeah, maybe case sensitive. Let me see. Interesting. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, anyways, uh, whenever I searched it last time, it, it came up. And essentially, what it gave you was our API. So the Chandler Police Department has an open data system you can go to in order to pull information about stuff that's happening in Chandler. You get GPS coordinates, you get uh, the information about the situation, you get all kinds of information that's publicly available, freely available to you all, uh, that anybody can go to. But searching for Chandler Police Department essentially led me to our own API site, which is working as intended. Uh, that's supposed to be open to the public, people should be able to find it, and people should be able to use it. Don't know why it's not working right now. And then you can also use HTML for the content. Let's try the content real quick. Nope. Uh, let me make sure this is not down right now. Nope, okay, interesting. Well, I'm not sure why that's not coming up, but uh, for here, I did a search on OS for Windows with HTTPS, uh, and I found 27,792 Windows computers that are available for connecting to by HTTPS. And here's all the information, OK? So is all of this information always good? Can we always trust it? Or is it potentially? there to mislead us or confuse us. Well, potentially, somebody can look at some of this data and they can add things, and then they can also add things like honeypots. So they were mentioned earlier, but what is a honeypot? Well, a honeypot is a software suite or server configuration designed to appear vulnerable, but is instead intended to allow a defender the ability to review and watch what an attacker may be doing. Now, the idea here being that you can learn much from an attacker who is operating at full capacity against what they believe to be a vulnerable system. And an extensive list of honeypots can be found on GitHub. So if we open this, it will take you to awesome honeypots. And there's a laundry list of different honeypots for different things. So if you want to run a NoSQL honeypot to find out what people are doing to attack NoSQL servers, you have that capability. You want to do the same thing with MySQL, or you want to be able to do it with Postgres, or maybe uh, a Google hack honeypot. You want to set something up so that potentially Google will swoop in and take a look at your web page. And then when somebody uses Google dorking to try to find a vulnerable web page, well, then they would find your site. And then when they come to your site to try to attack it, you could sit there and actually learn exactly what it is that they're doing, what behaviors they're taking. 
and there's a ton and just an absolute ton of them, all kinds of stuff. There's a SCADA honey net. So if you're running a SCADA system, excuse me, and you want to find out what people are doing to attack SCADA systems, well, there's one in there. Uh, there's actually a few for ICS and SCADA. There's botnet tools, uh, just a ton of stuff. And if you want to know some of the people who are running HoneyNet, Honey Pots, uh, for sure the FBI is because when we get further in, they actually publicly let everybody know exactly what network their Honey Pots are on. So they give out the IP addresses f essentially for their Honey Pots. And they let everybody know, these are FBI honeypots. Don't screw with them because we're using them for stuff. But in general, when you're sitting there and you're thinking about it and you're looking at it and you're like, well, why would you announce that? In general, the people who are doing this stuff, it's all automated and they're just designed to hit all IP addresses. So if you're not running some kind of blacklist to keep those systems out, you're going to hit those. Low-hanging fruit, right? That is essentially the internet version of like a bait car like we've all seen on TV. It's somebody from China is going to go in and they're going to do a mass scan and they're going to find a ton of systems and one of those systems is going to end up being an FBI honeypot and then they're going to have the ability to make a phone call and tell somebody that something bad is happening. And now whether or not that turns into something or not, who knows, but in general they can also use it to go back and see exactly what was ran against the server for further intelligence analysis. However, again, for an actual trained attacker, somebody who's going to go in there and try to figure this stuff out, many of these honeypots have very, very severe vulnerabilities in terms of being able to find out that they are a vulnerable system and not an actual, um, not an actual like target. Uh, you'll find that on some of them, if you cat Etsy password, so if you run cat space and then forward slash Etsy forward slash password, what you return in terms of users and stuff on the server will be the same for every single honeypot. So if that's the case, you can immediately log into the system, find out, okay, well, is it vulnerable or not, run cat against Etsy password, and then if the return from that is exactly the same for the cowrie honeypot that you just saw earlier, well, then now you know this is a honeypot system again. Now, some of these systems are designed to create like uh, randomized Etsy passwords and stuff like that, but many of them are not. They're not super fancy, they're just good enough for you to be able to run it on your network and then essentially be able to tell people, I'm running a honeypot, so I tick off this box on my cybersecurity checklist. Now let's talk about business intelligence for a second. So let's say I created a product, or I created a web page, or I created something, and I wanna, need, and I wanna know who's using this thing in an insecure manner. I can go to Shodan, and I can type in the information about my product, let's say port or potentially content for uh, the banner or anything like that. And then I can run searches regularly for my product and find out if somebody's running it with, let's say, default username and password. So if my banner is designed to automatically state, uh, you must change your username and password until they change it, well, I can search for that. I can put items to the system for them to return so that I can build intelligence on my own products. Now, obviously, people do this for their stuff, and we can search for that too, right? But when we're talking about good guy stuff, we want to do good guy things, what do you want to do? Well, you can look for your product, you can look for your port, you can keep a running tally of all public-facing instances of your product, and you can also find out who your competitors are and then use business intelligence analysis to say, okay, these are my competitors, and these are their servers, and potentially their servers are misconfigured. And so then I reach out to them and I ask them, hey, have you had problems with slowness? Have people been trying to break into your system? Do you have this or that or the other? And now you've turned it into a sales process. People are using these tools for that. They look up these companies, they find out whether or not they're running something incorrectly, and then they reach out to them to try to offer them a fix. So what about target acquisition? Now this is where we start getting into that blacklist that I talked about. Shodan provides plenty of information. We've already seen that. I type in different stuff into the system. We're finding all kinds of stuff, right? We know essentially what the makeup of some of the internet is by using this tool. However, after doing some extensive testing, what I did find out is the mass scan exclude list, exclude.conf, 
lists a whole bunch of networks in here that I tested against Shodan, and they didn't show up. So I can make a safe bet assumption, even though I don't know the contents of how Shodan is made or how they're programming it or anything like that, I can take a wild guess and say somebody came to this .conf and pulled it down and integrated that into whatever their back end is. If I had to guess, I bet they're running some kind of script on top of Mascan. If I really, really had to guess, like if this was like, oh, you can win a shiny new dollar, that's my guess. But when you go through this, you see all these different IP addresses, and then you start seeing letters, and you see information from different people. And if you were to go in here and start searching, you would find out, well, all the Army information system centers are based on 6.0.0.0 forward slash 8. Please don't scan those. And then US Defense Information Systems Agency, Defense Information Systems Agency, Comcast, Roadrunner, James Cable, so on and so forth, bunch of defense stuff, FBI's in here, all kinds of people are in here. They call this a blacklist. This also kind of doubles as a target list, right? Like, if you're a bad guy and you want to do bad things, this is probably your go-to list on where you want to actually go scan as opposed to where you want to start blocking this stuff. So this is kind of a double-edged sword, because once you start putting your stuff in here, like, if, uh, let me see if I can zoom in on that. Everybody see that? FBI honeypot, FBI honeypot, FBI honeypot. They let people know, if you come here, you are doing wrong. We do not want you to scan these. So therefore, they feel more comfortable in doing whatever it is that they decide to do, because they've already warned you. They put a sign out in front and smacked it down, and it says, do not trespass, right there. And you can just keep going. There's tons of stuff. Universities are in here. Yahoo's in here. Uh, you can go to the US Naval Academy. There's some special forces stuff, SOCOM, all kinds of people have put their information in here and said, please don't scan us. But again, that goes back to, OK, you've told people not to scan you, but you've also given them a great list for when they want to actually scan people to do bad things. Shodan does a great job of respecting that not scan list. Went in there and just hit a whole bunch of different IPs into it, and every single time it came back is no return. So I'm going to take a wild guess and say that they have integrated that list in some way. Do you all feel that an exclusion list also doubles as a very important target list? Now let's start getting into ICS stuff. Now this is usually the point where people get like, ooh, this is the scary part. Because what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about like red light cameras. We're going to talk about uh, LPR readers, license plate readers. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, power plants. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff here. And what you see here is these list of links, right? And you'll see down here also, see S7, port 102, S7, we talked about that. What's that? Telecom, cell phones, stuff like that, right? So for each one of these links that you go to, I have either the web page that is specifically for that product, or I have instruction manuals. Now, those instruction manuals will be listed as PDF, and you will see that. So if you click on it and it starts downloading a PDF, don't freak out because I told you it's a PDF. Uh, if you don't want to download that PDF, be sure to spin up a VM or whatever it is that you want to do to be able to follow through so you can read this stuff. But we have ICS Radar, Radar and ICS Map. Now these are two products that come from Shodan. So ICS Radar is essentially letting you know where, excuse me, open ICS systems are located. So we got Phoenix. Uh, they also try to identify honeypots because ICS honeypots, bless you, are real popular. So it'll throw those up there. But then you see ICS devices, all the little red dots are real ICS devices. So this thing is revealing the honeypots, it's revealing the actual items that are vulnerable, and then it's also letting you know where Shodan is scanning these items from because it's their crawler. So I'm going to go back here to the ICS map. Now, this is a really neat web page to go to as well. I kind of put it in in terms of, OK, so we have the really scary piece where everybody gets to see the spinning globe and all the, the you know, super high-tech stuff. 
And then we come to this, and they have a presentation, and they have different stuff that you can go to, and then they start explaining different items, including uh, analytical data that's historical for these items. So you can see some of the stuff that was previously available against the internet, and then some of the stuff that is not any longer. And then, of course, they have their uh, references as well. So I broke these down by ports. So you can see BACnet, DMP3, Ethernet over IP. Uh, you have Niagara Fox. You have IEC 104, Red Lion, Rot, Modbus. Each one of these devices communicates over a specific IP address and runs something like your power plants, uh, like your LPR readers, like your signs, like the signage that's out in front of uh, the, the highway that usually says something like don't drink and drive, things like that. Uh, all of those devices are internet facing or potentially internet facing and therefore accessible by people. <laughs> Let's pause for a second before we go forward because some of you are probably thinking to yourself, well, they probably have passwords, right? Well, you're probably right. So if you actually go to GitHub user content and you find this list, this is the actual SCADA default hard-coded passwords list that has the usernames and passwords for most of these devices. Okay? Because they're mostly they're, they're hard-coded. They're going to be there on the systems, essentially for somebody to be able to use it. Because again, what did we talk about? High availability versus high security, right? It's got to be able to run. If your, if your red lights and green lights and all that stuff stop working right, potentially somebody could die. So making it hard for somebody to get in there and work on these things or keep them up and running or having to manage all of the additional code that goes along with securing those tools, that potentially for a company is very difficult or very costly or causes them very, very many problems. So therefore, they have systems like this where you can go in and you can say, okay, my vendor is, let's say, Echelon. And we'll get to this in a second. I want you to see this word right here. I period LON smart server. That's really important. When you see ILON anywhere, you need to call somebody. Like you should probably pick up the phone and call uh, like the FBI and let them know or send them an email or go to the FBI reporting stuff and go and send them a little report. Because essentially uh, what ended up happening was is they realized that SCADA stuff and ICS is really, really dangerous to have available. You can blow up power plants. You can kill people. You can do all kinds of stuff. Again, high availability therefore high safety, therefore these are potentially items that can actually be used to cause harm. Um, we can, we're going to talk about some of the other stuff here in a minute, but they, it includes everything up to um, controlling things in hospitals. Okay, But having realized that, they took this system and they made it to where that system was no longer facing the internet, right? And so they built it into where it was essentially a local area network only and you would be able to work on these systems. So then you know what they decided to do? They created the ILON system to sit on top of that as a layer to remake it available to the internet. That, that was, uh, the company is called uh, Echelon. <laughs> as, you, as you can see right there, the company is called Echelon who essentially built this. So what they did was they knew this stuff was dangerous they took it off of the internet, but because people needed access to it and people were not smart enough to build things like VPNs and be able to deploy all this, they then made a web page and created a web interface to be able to sit in front of it and then make it available to themselves again. I know, I, and I see people looking at me like, well, that sounds completely insane. I agree, I agree. It was, it's probably not a good idea. But that's why that ILON stuff is very important. And we'll get, again, we'll get to it in a little bit. But I wanted you all to see this. These are all the devices. There's the usernames and passwords all right here. And most of them, it's, it's really cool because essentially they're all like admin, admin, user, admin, root, root. Like literally the stuff that we all know you should never use, that's what they are. Yeah, there we go. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, zero, 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 zero. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and some of them are blank. 
you just hit enter. And there are some systems where there is absolutely no control over who can log in and who cannot. It's essentially you connect through Telnet, you automatically have access to everything. There is no login ter terminal. There's not even a place to put in a username and password, okay? So that's a huge list of all kinds of things that have default usernames and passwords. That's a massive list, okay? And it's all available, again, off of the internet. So have people actually used this to cause harm to anybody? Like, do we know that? Well, sure. What's an awesome thing to look for if you want to steal data? You can cheat right here, Elasticsearch, OK? So if you have an Elasticsearch server, does anybody, has anybody ever set up Elasticsearch in here? A few of us, a couple of us? Does Elasticsearch straight out of the box have any kind of username and password on the data? No. Yeah. You can essentially just like tell that into it, and then you can just pull all the data out, send a post request. You send a post request, and you can just pull everything out. OK? So there are a ton of people who have set up Elasticsearch servers that are running with what kind of information? Well, right here I have an example where they were running a Elastisac server and they were running the NFL's information on it. So tons and tons of information about all the people in the NFL was available off of an Elastisac server, which was publicly available that you could send a post request to and pull all of the data from. And so they did. And then the other thing they decided to do was then to send the information back, but then ransomware it. So then they didn't even have access to their information anymore. So they pulled all the data down and then ransomware it, and they were done. Okay, So that's that one, and you can read that off of the site. Again, the NFL. So you can read about their stuff. This one goes to, I guess now you have to uh, log in. Don't just Google the name of the article and then hit cached on Google, just FYI, if you don't know. And then how about, anybody know about the exact, exactus breach? Let's see if this one loads up. Three hundred and forty million personal records for people here within the United States all leaked by exactus off of a open Elastistack server. Okay. The whole U.S. Three fourths population. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's the entire U.S. And then, in addition to that, uh, we can also think about the breach that happened at where Equifax. Yeah. And I'm fairly certain Equifax was also an Elastistack server. I don't think that they've come out and they just said it like they weren't just like yes, it was Elastistack. But I'm fairly certain theirs was an open Elastistack server. And where are you going to generally see these systems? Amazon AWS. So you're going to look for Elastistack hosted on Amazon AWS within the continental US, and you're going to find tons and tons and tons of these things 100% open with absolutely no security on them. Because, yes? Does, does it also include the like, S3 boxes and the permissions, the rewrite permissions on them? So for instance, the uh, going into the election, the Republican Party had gone through and put all of their data on an S3 petition, or partition that was completely open to anybody in the, uh, in the world. It was, it was world readable. Uh, and there have been a couple of other instances like that where basically the data store is world readable. Sure. So uh, yes, I know for a fact that you can use Shodan to look that up. I don't know the exact command that you need to put in to be able to find the banner for it. But if you know the banner essentially for the tool that they're using, then yes, search for that banner and you'll be able to find that data if they're doing it. All right. So this is some notes essentially that I created for different items that are out there that could potentially be of concern for us, especially security researchers and also people who work or live in like cities, right? So the very first one is going to be the ILON stuff. And uh, I have the PDF for how to work ILON. So I'll open this real quick. And this is the IP server user's guide for ILON. That took me about 20 seconds to Google for and find. So they created a 100% vulnerable system. And then they took the instruction manual for it, for exactly how to use it, and put that up on the internet. And then using nothing but the information 
from the text within the banner for Ilon, I was then able to locate the user manual for Ilon. So you could find a vulnerable Ilon server plus the instruction manual to go along with it, and within maybe 35, maybe less minutes, you can sit there and get good enough to be able to break it or destroy whatever it is behind it. Okay? So there is your user guide right there with full preface and what models this affects, uh, your PC hardware requirements. And as you can see, these are generally very old systems, right? Pentium 2, 600 megahertz or faster. These systems are slower than Raspberry Pis, okay? 128 megabytes of RAM. This is DOS stuff. Yeah, it's DOS stuff, exactly, and that's exactly what you're connecting to. You're connecting to systems that were in use and created back in like the 80s and have been in use ever since. And these systems are to the point where people actually uh, go out and do what amounts to treasure hunting in terms of a company will come in and tell you, I have an ICS system that simply cannot die, and I need you to go out to eBay, and I need you to go to foreign countries. Uh, there's a company called NEC in Japan. Anybody familiar with them? Yes. yes. So NEC in Japan created computers that essentially were personal computers in Japan, but over here they used them for ICS systems. So if you were to try to buy one of those computers from Japan and you wanted it for personal use, like to play games, you can do so, and it's going to run you maybe like a couple of hundred bucks. But then if you go in and you type in the exact same model number, but you want the ruggedized version, which is the per version for like ICS, they're selling them for like $40,000. Because people go out and they search for these things because they know these systems break. And do you want to spend $50 million to re-update and re-upgrade your entire ICS system for your power plant? Or do you want to go to NEC and pay $40,000 to some treasure who found the computer that you need and has now put it up on American eBay to sell it to you so that you can pull a couple of chips out of it. And that's what we're living on, okay? This, this is what keeps us alive. This is what's happening in the background that we don't see, all right? And Super VGA graphics, that's really cool. <laughs> awesome, Super 480, VGA. 480, 480 was too, uh, too old. Uh, where's my notes? Sorry, let me get back to that. How about stoplights? Anybody ever heard of a company called Econolite? So almost any stoplight system in use today is essentially internet uh, managed. Now it's not necessarily internet facing, but it's internet managed. Now here's the company, Econolite. And they say they're building a safer, connected world. However, if you go here, then we have a breakdown by Malathi Vera Raghavan, who is a professor uh, at the University of Virginia. And he explains exactly how the system works and gives us enough keywords in here that if you were to use the information found within this to go out and search for these things, you can locate the, uh, the, uh, the lights, the ones that are internet facing. So you have a gentleman who put out a bunch of information about the architecture, the FCC allocated bands that are connected to it, uh, your safety margin, your critical safety channels, Here's your worldwide ITS spectrum allocations. You have everything that you need to know exactly how these systems function overseas as well as here within the United States with enough keywords to poke into Shodan so that you can then start pulling these tools down. Okay? Guy doesn't know better than to use Comic Sans for his presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe he's just doing it to punish us. <laughs> how about license plate readers? So this is a company called Autoplate. And that's their default usernames and passwords for all of their LPR readers, as well as all of the access there. And then we have their uh, a breakdown on exactly how to locate those systems. And then in addition, we have the link to the company. So if you go here, this guy on his web page decided after finding one of these LPRs to essentially disassemble the thing and figure out how it works with all of the breakdown 
of what's available, what commands can be used, and how they function. And then just goes through it so that he can try to show you as much of it as he can. Okay? And so that's publicly available to the internet. So if you find his web page, you take the information that's located within there, dump that into Shodan, and now you're finding all the LPR readers that are available through the internet. Uh, and that LPR reader is generally connected to, um, to the cameras that are like the red light cameras or the speeding cameras. In addition to that, on uh, a presentation that was pre provided at DEF CON, when they showed how those red light cameras function, the guy essentially went in using those um, open usernames and passwords and all the stuff, all the information that they've essentially dumped to the internet, and was able to tell the camera to start sending all of the tickets directly to his house. So instead of, when it would snap the shot, instead of giving the information to the people that needed it in order to create the ticket, he was just having the, the photos and all the information sent off into the Aether where they were just disappearing. And then every time they would go in and fix it, he could go in and just change it back. And he was demonstrating that at DEF CON. So it's not like this stuff isn't known. It's not like this is like a surprise or people are like, oh man, this is all brand new. This is stuff that's been going on for quite a while, just nobody really talks about it. How about Dactronic signs? What do you think those are? We talked about them for a few seconds. Those are the signs that are located on the highway. So whenever you see somebody put like, warning, zombies attacking, turn around now for your own safety and stuff like that, in general what they've done is they've gotten into the Dactronic sign either through the internet or through a direct connection to the sign by climbing down to it. Okay, those are essentially your two options on those. How about car washes? Because those are all car washes that are available through ICS right now. Okay? The system is called Laser Wash, and there's tons of information available at online, but it uses Chip PC Extreme or Intermec CK31. And the whole system is available over 8081 or 8001, with most of the systems located here within the United States. So all of this stuff right here, all this laser wash, PDQ laser wash, PDQ laser wash, PDQ laser wash, again, and they all show HTTP unauthorized, but essentially all you do is you go find out what the username and password is for it, and then now you have access to car washes that are all internet facing. How about emergency telco systems? That's probably important, right? You would think that those would be protected. How about not? So AZ Tech is the company that runs many of these emergency telco systems, both within the United States as well as overseas. Emergency telecom systems being what? Like your 911 system? You would think that would be kind of an important system that we would want to protect, probably keep that safe, right? Well, for many of these places, they're not doing that. Some of them are hosted on Amazon.com. Some of them on Origin Broadband, Origin Polska, Northern New Mexico seems to have their system internet facing right now. And again, they're just using things like Nginx, Rust, or Pro FTPD. Uh, this is the AZ Tech webpage. So they're hosted out of Ireland. And you can see that their webpage is running on WordPress. So AZ Tech themselves have a WordPress web page that they're using for their stuff for internet facing slash customer facing. And then the rest of the, the items that they're setting up for some of these places are being allowed to be set up improperly. Now we can even get into things like uh, webcams and homes. Uh, there's a lot of wealthy people who are running webcams inside of their houses that are completely internet facing with no security. Uh, you can look into those. There's all kinds of stuff that goes along with this, right? I uh, also pulled this. I just want to go over this real quick. Which, that right there is the AZ Tech Network's information for here within the United States. So if you were going to go sit down and go actually find out, okay, so I want to go and I want to find out, okay, here's the AZ Tech system and here's how it's being used and here's how it's being misused, and then in addition to that, I want to pivot over and I want to find out more information about the company, well then potentially what does this become? It becomes a gateway to being able to do what? If I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call somebody and pretend to be somebody, what's that? 
uh, well, sw swatting potentially, but, but there's another, another word for this. Social engineering, thank you. So potentially now I have enough information about the company, as well as the product, as well as how the product looks, potentially, because I'm connecting to this thing. Um, I did demonstrations of social uh, engineering for some sheriffs once. Had the sheriffs all sit down with me, and I was sitting there, and I told them, I can get your password for essentially everything that you have. Like, you need to understand that everything that you have is unprotected. And they were like, no, 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 that's not blah, blah, blah. I mean, these were pretty important dudes. If you've never worked with sheriffs before, essentially the actual sheriff is kind of like king of his fiefdom. And they are not used, they don't like surprise, okay? And I told him, look, man, everything that you have is 100% undefended. And the guy was like, no, not possible. And I said, okay. And I picked up the phone and I made a phone call. And I was able to pretend to be somebody that I wasn't. And I was able to gain a whole bunch of information. And then from there, I was able to pivot and then just told them, yeah, man, I'm, just, I'm not good with computers. And I need my username and password. Can you just send it to me? And they did. And it was that easy. It went from, I need help. And I'm a angry, grumpy man into, well, if you just help me, then I'm not so grumpy anymore. And then they were just like, yeah, just just go, just get out of here. And it's that easy. So this is also, as you're working through this stuff, it's information that can be used beyond what we're just learning here. It is, man, I'm sitting at my computer right now, and I'm looking at this stupid blinking cursor, and it says this, this, and this at the top, and I'm, dude, can you just help me? And then you turn on the baby screaming in the background, and you're like, yeah, man, I'm a contractor who works from home. I got the baby screaming in the background. Do you hear that? Give me the password, please. And then potentially it turns into the password. How about speakers? This one's funny, just on account of the fact that the QSA 500D speakers, if you can find access to those on the internet, you can actually um, file transfer an MP3 file directly to it, and then it will just play it. And these speakers are used at places like, um, like rinks, and uh, like uh, football places and stuff like that. So they use these speakers. And essentially, you just send it an MP3 file, and it'll just start playing it. OK? So that one's kind of funny in terms of like that's the trolley thing. Like you find one of those open, and you just it becomes a troll toy. In addition to that, I threw in a link to a DEF CON video in here, because we have that as well. Uh, it's very interesting. It takes about 30 minutes. If you want to look it up, type in DEF CON and then uh, Shodan on YouTube. And you can go to that. Very good video. Like I said, it's maybe 20, 30 more minutes. Um, not a lot of stuff that I'm not talking about in here because I did take some of my stuff from that. But it's still pretty good. So how about building a Shodan alternative? Now this is where we get to that masking part. Because again, Shodan does what? It respects blacklists. People can contact Shodan and tell them to stop. There's a whole bunch of things that Shodan does where they play nice so that they get to continue to exist. But if you're not worried about that and you want to be a bad person, that's where Mascan comes in. Because Mascan lets you be bad. So what you need is a copy of Mascan and a copy of Elastistack. Preferably not on your network and not on your credit card. Okay? Because once you start doing these massive scans of the internet, that's when people from China are going to call and say, stop hacking all the things. Because that's the exact same letter that they sent to the guy who created MassScan. Now, this command right here, MassScan 0000 forward slash 0, and then that list of ports right there, and then banners and rate. That right there, that command, allows you to run a fully unrated mass scan across every IP on the internet, including all of the ones that are on that blacklist, looking for open ports off of that list. Now, what does that mean? That means you're going to find honeypots. You're going to find networks that you shouldn't be on. You're going to find a ton of stuff that is all available off of that command right there. In addition to that, there are additional commands that you can run off of mass scan to allow you to distribute this over other computers. So people will oftentimes gain access to a botnet and then when they, uh, once you have access to, let's say, 100 computers on that botnet, but you know that you're looking for very specific IoT devices, well, you can plug all of that IoT device in terms of ports, banners, all of that information in here, and you can very quickly spread out to find more vulnerable devices. 
Does that make sense? Again, it's pivoting. It's, it's moving from, okay, I have two devices here, and I know that other devices of similar lot are vulnerable, so then I want to use these two devices to search for more. And then once those are infected, oftentimes what they do is they become part of that search, and it very quickly moves out. And we've seen this before, right? Mirai, Mirai botnet, very, very similar concept. We've already seen it in action. Okay, but really, does Shodan do anything practical? Sure, absolutely it does. So if we were to go and do NTP for city of Chandler and we look for the NTP servers within the city of Chandler, what's NTP? Network time protocol. Can network time protocol be used to do bad things? Yeah, it sure can. So worldwide right now, there are approximately 9,248,986 potentially vulnerable NTP servers on Earth at this very moment, okay, as of a couple of weeks ago. How about in the city of Chandler? Well, approximately 914 of them, okay? So just within the city of Chandler, you have 914 NTP servers, and they are running NTP and have an open port of 123. And here's one of them right here, just out in the middle of Chandler. Uh, that's off of a Cox, okay? And that's somebody's house. And essentially, they're running NTP. For whatever reason, they've got an open NTP what do you think that is? That's a Python script that allows you to create an NTP amplification attack, a DDoS. So all you have to do is feed it a list of NTP servers, like let's say, oh, I don't know, 9 million of them. And if you have enough devices, then at that point you have a tidy little botnet that will DDoS whatever it is that you point at it. Okay? because the system is pre-built for you out there. Uh, what's another one? How about DNS? DNS servers with what activated? What do we need on that DNS server to be activated for it to be relatively bad? It needs to be recursive, okay? It needs to be able to do recursive searches. So you can actually go in to Shodan and you can type in DNS and then recursive and it will find those recursive DNS servers that are potentially vulnerable that you can use for doing bad things. And then from there you have your list of tools plus whatever script that you get and then you can use that. Yes? Doesn't DNS set uh, mitigate that risk though? Not everybody's in it though. And not everybody's got their systems up to date. So even though I'm saying 9 million potential devices some of them are up to date, some of them have mitigation, some of them have the correct working stuff, but not everybody's running the latest and greatest. So let's go over our answers as we start to wind it down and then I'll open up for you know, questions for the last 10, 15 minutes. What is Shodan, right? Shodan is a search engine for, internal, for internet connected devices and it provides information such as ports, banners, and is an excellent source of intelligence on the current state of the internet. And we can use it for a ton of stuff, right? We can use it for attack vectors, we can use it for social engineering. We can use it for any number of things. A simple search for open ports, devices, or program names can be conducted directly from the Shodan webpage in a manner similar to how Google, DuckDuckGo, or other search engines function. You all saw me doing it right here from a tablet. We don't even need a real computer, okay? Now you can build your own version of Shodan using tools like MassScan in combination with Elasticsearch. Harder, more effort, but a potential necessary need, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And Shodan is most useful when you're trying to perform reconnaissance. It's an information gathering tool. It's open source intelligence, potentially. So let's talk about that word on vocabulary. Now, is Shodan OSINT or SIGINT? What do you all think? So I'm going to give you some definitions real quick. OSINT, or open source intelligence, is the gathering of data from open source or readily and freely available sources. While SIGINT, or signals intelligence, is the act of gathering information in transit by interception. So are we intercepting data? or are we So open source intelligence, right? We're not really intercepting anything, we're not doing anything harmful, and we're not hurting anybody, right? It's taking public information. Public information. 
So I do, too, believe that Shodan is OSINT when in use by researchers and potentially SIGINT when deployed by the company themselves. Okay? So if you are working for a company and you're a pen tester and you're going to do a search um, and you work for Shodan and you are doing this, Shodan is most likely doing SIGINT, whereas we, as researchers using their tool, it turns into OSINT. Now, does this matter? Is this a big deal? Probably not, but whenever you're having discussions with people, um, particularly in regards to your job, being able to understand the vocabulary that you're using may be of use to you. So, in my opinion, Shodan is an excellent tool for researching the internet when you do not have the capability to perform the search yourself. Using Shodan frees you from the infrastructure management and liability that can come from running mass scan from a server you own. You run mass scan from your infrastructure, potentially you're going to get yourself in trouble. You use Shodan, as long as you're not doing anything dumb with it, probably going to be just fine. Now, Shodan is a simple tool that protects the user from reprisal, but also poses security dilemmas itself. Shodan does require an account for some searching. It logs users and is able to study information such as what is being searched, clicked on, or viewed. Everything that we did tonight on Shodan, they know about. And they have that information. And if you were to go out and do something stupid, using that information that you gathered from Shodan, guess what? Potentially, somebody's going to go to Shodan and say, hey, was somebody looking for this? And they will be able to very quickly go back and say, oh, yeah, there was a person who was looking in Austin for these specific servers and was looking for this very specific information, and then so on and so forth, and they will drill it down to a set of IP addresses, and that starts somebody's investigation. Okay? So you should not rely on Shodan for any reason in which you could possibly be met with a reprisal as it is an opaque box. It's somebody's tool and they're lending it to you. It is not your tool. You do not how, know how it is built. You do not know how things are logged. You do not know who it communicates with. Potentially in real time, everything that you are doing with Shodan is going to somebody who is paying very, very close attention to it. Okay? Because I know if it was my toy, I would be doing that. It just makes good business sense. <sighs> Because I want you all to think about this. If you work in the government and your job is to protect people and your job is to protect infrastructure and you don't know at any one time what infrastructure is potentially vulnerable but people start searching for specific infrastructure, would you not want to know about that? Would you not want that information? That information has to go to somebody. Okay. So ultimately, Shodan is a beneficial tool that allows you to conduct deep and telling reconnaissance of a target while all while never firing off a packet yourself. All right? It is not foolproof, and it requires an account, and therefore, again, generates an audit log. You should not use Shodan if you are worried about an audit of your use. Final recommendations. Use Linux. Learn tools, but also learn how those tools work. You need to think about this stuff. Bless you. Just because you have a tool and you have access to that tool, if you don't know what that tool is actually doing, potentially you're causing yourself or other people harm, right? Practice and at all times document what you're doing, particularly for those of us who are penetration testers who are in or who are interested in the act of being a penetration tester, you need to be good at documentation. Notebook, pen, write things down, keep track of what you're doing, and be able to turn around and walk back. Also, don't hesitate to practice being able to explain it to somebody else even if it's only in the mirror. But you need to be able to tell people what steps you took to get to a certain point. Because oftentimes those steps are extremely important in being able to conduct an investigation or to get, somebody, get somewhere with that data. Because if I come up to you and I tell you, I got a ton of data and it's all right here and it's about the super bad guy and he's doing bad things. And then they have to ask you, well, how did you ascertain or gather that information? And you go, well, dude, I don't know but this is my stuff, don't you want it? Potentially, you are blocking yourself out from be having, being able to use that information. You need to be able to explain it, okay? So that goes for my penetration testers, it goes for my investigators, it goes for anybody. If you can't explain how you got it, it's not gonna do you any good. Uh, and I think that covers everything. So we've got about 10 minutes-ish before we start closing up. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yes, it did. He was super irate, and I got to listen to him scream into a phone for a while. So I think that there were changes that were made. Anything else?
Absolutely. I mean, they could be. So say we wanted to uh, you know, protect ourselves from this being a problem for us. Is this possible for one thing? And, and you know, if it is, how, I guess. So really what you have to worry about is your, your threat footprint is essentially what you're concerned about here. What are you putting out on the internet that somebody is gaining access to? Now, if you're running a web page, uh, let's say Nginx, obviously people are going to know that you're running port 80, port 443, and that you're running Nginx. And the reason why they would know that is because you want them to connect to it. So they are able to ascertain that information. Now, if you're worried about putting something particularly vulnerable on the internet, or you're doing something that you're concerned about people finding it, at that point, you need to start looking at mitigation tools, like potentially putting it into a private network and creating a VPN, uh, allowing that VPN to be maybe a connection over SSH. So port 22 is open, and people can SSH into the system, but then they're doing port forwarding with switch L. And so, you know, even if your device is on port 4001, then they SSH into port 22 with a switch L for 4001 and bring that back onto their system locally, and then they connect that way. Very similar to how I tell people to set up their Freenet installation. Same idea. And again, it's why you should use this tool to look at your own network. What am I showing people? What kind of information can they ascertain from it? What can I ascertain from it? And then how does that threaten me? Whenever you take this class, I'll tell you all the exact same thing that I tell all of my students. Learn how the tool works and fixes things or what it does for you. But then in addition to that, you need to learn how it is a weapon. Again, RMRF, great thing because it deletes a folder with all of the contents, right? But RMRF, forward slash, and then a sudo in front of that. Now, what are we doing? We're deleting essentially everything on the computer, and we're doing something bad. So it can be a harmful thing, or it could be a nice thing. Uh, it's just commands, and it's just how you use them. So you got to pay attention. Uh, but no, there is not really a way other than to maybe tell them, hey, this is my IP address, and this network is really important to me, and I'm not very confident in it being secure, so please don't scan it. But go ahead and add me to your very important target list also. So it's all trade-offs. So I think you touched on this, but just to make sure. So if one wanted to look for like specific, uh, you know, Cisco routers or something, sure, like that, and it would actually, if you were to find devices that you knew had vulnerabilities, <coughs> you'd be able to just find them. Yeah, you would. So like right here, it's funny that you would use Cisco. So Cisco and then Net and then add an IP address with, uh, you know, Switch Twenty Four or whatever, and that right there will find all of the Cisco devices off of whatever IP address that you set with that net. And so if you wanted to drill down that far, you could do so. Or you could just say, I just want all the Cisco. Just give me anything Cisco, and then I'll just figure it out myself. So yes, it's all right there for you, directly available. Is there a notion of a timestamp that's returned? With yes, there is. Uh, let me see if I've still got one of these up, and I can show you. So like this one, uh, you can see within the header right here, date 19 July 2018, 01 1952 GMT. So that's the last time that this thing pulled for that IP. Anything else? No? Where this information is coming from, the servers here in the US? Yes, well, sort of. So again, as I explained, the the Shodan system itself is fairly opaque. They said themselves that this is custom code slash this is their own search engine and that they wrote this themselves. But by looking at how mass scan works, we can get a pretty good idea of how their system works in terms of they have a web crawler. That web crawler sends out packets to different ports and different IP addresses all over the internet with those servers located all over the world. And essentially, they just go out and rescan the internet off of every IP address and every port every so often in order to gather that information and then just turn it into something that you can actually look at. It just makes it pretty. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just thinking that with the, the laws that were passed in the last few years, a lot of people are moving their stuff offshore to keep the government from 
making it harder for the government to get access to that kind of information? Well, you really have to remember, depending on where you're sending it, it's really either less secure or even worse. Because, and this, obviously this gets into a whole bunch of different arguments here, and some people may disagree. But what you need to understand is when you're a US citizen and your information is here within the United States, you are afforded certain protections. But when you are a US citizen and your information is overseas, like in, let's say, France, potentially, if the people know how to contact somebody in France and get that data, France is extremely uh, friendly with the United States, oftentimes very happy to assist, and you're not a French citizen. You're a US citizen. And so they will play ball with your data in order to get the US to play ball with one of their citizens' data. And oftentimes there's trading going on in terms of, okay, I'm gonna give you this guy right here, and I know he's a US citizen, and I know he's doing bad things, so you guys can have him. But hey, you know those two uh, French nationals that are over here? Could you uh, send us their information? And you can see examples of that directly afforded through the leaks that were provided by Edward Snowden. So it's not like I'm up here like, oh, maybe this is happening. Well, they have examples of it within Edward Snowden's leaks of these are the kind of tools that are being used within what's known as Five Eyes and Seven Eyes uh, because those are different groups of countries that are involved in information sharing. So, <laughs> and I'm going to say what I say to other people that I train with. Uh, I want you all to understand that this isn't to like scare the hell out of everybody or to make you all super depressed. Oftentimes we have classes where we're taught like don't sit with your back towards the door, right? Because you don't want to sit with your back towards the door because somebody will come in and shoot you in the back of the head. That's the kind of training that we receive. Well, this is your training of don't sit with your back towards the internet, all right? You need to head on a swivel, sit down, and position yourself properly so that you know what's going on around you and you can see what's happening and you can pay attention. Uh, we will often hear it in military or occasionally police as condition yellow, okay? Condition white being just like, do to do I'm just bopping along and I'm not thinking about anything, not looking at anything. Condition yellow is the idea that, okay, I'm paying attention to what's happening around me. I understand that in the event that, uh, you know, the power to my house goes out and then I go outside and I look and all of the power is out, potentially these are the things that could have happened. Uh, it's just knowing and gathering enough information that you can better serve yourself in the future if you need it. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So it's not about being sad, it's about being informed. Or both. You know, however you feel. <laughs> however you feel, both is fine. Anything else? No? Well, I want to thank you all for coming out and spending your Thursday with us. Thank you for coming here and learning. And uh, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your dog. Uh, we'd love to have see more people in here, um, and if you have something that you want to learn about uh, and it doesn't look like it's on our list of things that we're going to be teaching, reach out to me, reach out to anybody at the Phoenix Linux Users Group, let them know what you want to see in here because I'd be happy to create any kind of class that I can to better educate you guys about whatever topic that you want to learn about. And if I can't do it, I'll find somebody to do it. So thank you again for coming out tonight.